And so our next flash presenter is Dr. Sonia Flores, who's professor and vice chair of diversity and justice in the division of pulmonary sciences and critical care here at the Anschutz Medical Campus. She's been a leader and pioneer in providing training programs for those underrepresented in medicine and science. And I think her work really epitomizes how promoting diversity in the PhD workforce contributes to biomedical advances, to economic growth, knowledge, and to addressing the needs of all communities. So Dr. Flores. Thank you, Dr. Dickham. So um, is this on? Can you hear me? So thank you so much. And I really appreciate this invitation. I have to uh, admit that this is a kind of a different um, uh, way of, of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it made me think a lot about, you know, how do we incorporate these principles into uh, creating a healthy and ethical research structure? Uh, another caveat is that I'm a basic scientist and uh, trained biochemist, and this is something that I came to late in life, but I've always been very passionate about um, these topics. So hopefully I will have provided a roadmap of how we can incorporate a lot of these uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion when we're trying to set up a, a healthy uh, research culture. So I always like to try uh, and define what diversity and equity mean before we actually start talking about them. So I, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I find it a great representation of what equality, equity, and justice mean. So what we have here is a, a three panels with three individuals. And as you can see, the three individuals are of different heights, right? And we know that height is something that is genetic, genetically determined. So it's not something that they could change about uh, their own lives. So there are three different heights. They're trying to watch a, um, a I'm sorry, they're, they're trying to watch a, a, a soccer game but notice that even though they're standing on support systems that are exactly the same height, one of them is not able to watch the game, regardless of the fact that that person is standing on a support system. And this is the concept of equal treatment, which again, is something that we talk about, but it really doesn't offer all three individuals the access to the game that they should have had. The middle panel talks about equity. And here what we have is that the three individuals are standing on support systems that are commensurate with their height. So that now all three of them are able to watch the game. One of them, because of their height, does not need the support system. So again, this is the concept of affirmative action, which um, misconception is that quotas and affirmative action are the same thing. No, affirmative action is where we now create opportunities for those who did not have the privileges that some people have growing up. The third panel is the concept of justice, and that's our aspirational goal. And notice that in the third panel, the systemic barrier, which is the wooden fence, has been removed and now has been repla replaced with a chain link fence so that nobody needs the support systems. Everybody now is able to access the game and the systemic barriers, what caused the inequities has been addressed. And again, when we talk about institutional policies, this is exactly what we want to achieve, is examine what we're doing are we really creating the infrastructures that we are now eliminating some of these systemic barriers? So I like this quote by Verna Myers. Uh, she says that diversity is when you invite me to a dance, whereas inclusiveness is when you dance with me. So what good does it do me if you, know, you want to show a lot of diversity by having a lot of different colored faces uh, and all of a sudden that I care about diversity, but you know, if you invite me to a dance, but nobody dances with me, I'm still marginalized. I'm still sitting in a corner. Nobody's talking to me. It's until that someone asks me to dance and has a conversation with me, then now I feel included in the dance. So, you know, this is something that we need to always keep in mind is that, you know, when we write these statements about diversity, some institutions think that, you know, that gives them a pass, you know, we've, we fulfill our role, but it doesn't matter if we're not creating the structures for these individuals to act actively participate in the system. So how do we apply these concepts to research teams? So in when we have an equitable lab, we have to elevate people to hold as much space uh, as others by providing more support to them, right? Some people already have the agency. They don't need the space. Others don't. So we have to create that space for them. Inclusion is now we have to ensure that these individuals not only occupy the space, but that they are welcome, elevated, and that their voices are heard, right? So you are getting the, the sense of what the differences are between, you know, when we talk about equity and diversity, 
we cannot talk about them without talking about uh, inclusion. And we need to assemble research teams that are very diverse. And that's only the first step, right? I mean, creating um, a space where everybody uh, is different, different backgrounds, but we need to be intentional about creating and ensuring that these environments are both equitable and inclusive. Now, what are some of the systemic barriers that we encounter in research? Again, as I mentioned before, you know, diversity um, is not good enough if we don't include, we don't have inclusivity with that. So it's not just simply checking a box, but rather an ethical imperative to the scientific process because we know that diverse teams are much more effective than teams that are monolithic or homogeneous. And we know that institutional changes in many cases um, at the top leadership level, levels are very slow to happen. And in, in many cases, because they're top down, uh, 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 those who are on the trenches actually resent these top down mandates. And in many cases, it's people like us, staff or faculty, who are the primary change agents if we really want to include DEIJ in the research teams. And again, as I mentioned before, interdisciplinary teams are very, very important, but unfortunately, in many cases, they do recreate some of these hierarchical structures of race, gender, identity, and experience and sexuality. So even though we're trying to create this inclusive uh, diverse teams, we need to be co cognizant of the fact that there, the power differentials still exist. So we need to acknowledge those and work very actively and uh, very um, deliberately to uh, address them. So why is diversity important in research? Again, we know that diverse teams are good for team dynamics. Uh, the, the highest performing teams are very diverse. Uh, and the most important thing about this is that all of the members of that team are committed to the same outcomes, right? Everybody is invested in, you know, publications, getting grants, et cetera, because everybody benefits. But with that comes the responsibility that these members of the team have to be acknowledged. And um, we also need to make sure that these diversity of perspectives, expertise, et cetera, are, um, are uh, addressed a priori and if we don't do that, it could compromise the integrity of the research. So all of these should be addressed openly. We know that collaborating partners should ensure that authorship and acknowledgement of all contributors is managed ethically and fairly. And again, it should be part of the compact or contract or whatever you uh, come up with where all of the expectations are aligned. And uh, again, authorship and acknowledgement of all contributors should be managed ethically and fairly. And again, a priori and uh, allowing individuals to actively participate and share their ideas. And again, what we want is for the team members to be engaged and to reach the same team goals. So how do we ensure that uh, we include diversity uh, and inclusion in research? Again, we need to develop practices that support and include all team members. Again, everybody has to have a voice at the table. Invest the time to establish shared expectations for working together and establish a process for how to raise concerns and resolve conflicts. So, you know, we talked about what are some of the values when we're talking about research integrity and research ethics. Transparency communications are absolutely essential. And this has to be done before even uh, before a new team member uh, uh, joins the team. And uh, to create research teams that are diverse, equitable, and inclusive, we should all engage in a reflective process to examine where the power lies, because again, we do know that there will still be power differentials. So it is important that whoever is in charge of that team establish the rules that all of the voices will be heard equally. And this is something that uh, we also, uh, some of us have experienced, but it's fairly common. And this is the exploitation and unethical treatment of research team members. And an example is, for example, graduate students or postdocs or junior scholars uh, so that they're, they do the work, but then they are unacknowledged. They're either not included in the authorship, they're not mentioned in the acknowledged and what happened in the acknowledgements. And what happens, unfortunately, is that the person who's in charge of the team, in many cases is the PI, will advance their career at the expense and on the backs of those who were exploited. And again, we all experience this. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to step up to the plate and communicate, you know, I did this amount of work for this. I, my name should be included as a co-author or even in the acknowledgements. So 
the 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 problem is that long term these students and mentees rarely will achieve the same level of professional success because again the profits of the labor are uh, borne by the PI or someone someone else. So again, unfortunately, this happens very frequently, and I think it should be part of the training for graduate students to address some of these issues, especially when they're considering joining a lab. Uh, so how about uh, talking about research integrity and some of the practices? So research integrity is the principles and standards that have the, uh, the purpose to ensure validity and trustworthiness of the research. So adhering to the principles of research integrity, honesty, accountability, we heard this before by Dr. Um, Gonzalez. Professional courtesy, fairness, again, this is where the justice comes in, right? Where now we have uh, eliminated some of the systemic barriers that keep people marginalized and behind. And again, these are all the hallmarks of good research practices. And practices that perpetuate power imbalances and allow these power imbalances to continue are detrimental to the research practices. Again, uh, those practices actually will result in only the career advancement of one of the individuals or some of the individuals in the team, but not everybody. And these are the, the some of the characteristics of research integrity, fairness of opportunity. And again, this has to be discussed before the research is initiated. Everybody will be given the opportunity to publish if you do the work and everybody collaborates work as a team. Uh, during the research collaboration, of course, you know, there has to be a process that's very explicit and very transparently discussed that will allow everybody to share in the fruits of the labor. And of course, the fair sharing of benefits, costs, and outcomes after the research has been completed. And again, you start talking about, you know, what are we going to publish? How are we going to publish this? What is the order of the authorship? Again, there are very specific guidelines as to how the authors should be included in the publications. And uh, if we want to cultivate inclusive lab environments, um, we need to uh, start with, from a different mindset uh, in an inclusive model. We have to forget about that the individual mentee is more important than the techniques, right? Sometimes we're hiring somebody, a postdoc, a graduate student for our lab, and all we care about, I mean, how much research have you done? What, what techniques have you learned? When again, we need to look at each one individually. and cultivating the uniqueness of each team member is what best positions all of us to bring um, our whole selves to the scientific inquiry process. And this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. So doing science through authentic research, you know, providing research opportunities for people who haven't had access to research because they don't have any role models, they didn't grow up in an environment where people knew about research. Providing those experiences is the key mechanism uh, to attract uh, students and postdocs from underrepresented backgrounds to enter scientific research careers. And this is the reason why I have worked very uh, uh, extensively for the past 25 years in developing pipeline programs and career development, development programs like GEMS, which I'm not going to talk about, and the Pride A Gold, which I'm going to describe in a few, uh, the next few slides. So this is a program uh, funded by Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute from NIH. And uh, we actually focus on the impact of ancestry and gender on omics of lung and cardiovascular diseases. And the idea is that we have a lot of these huge uh, reams of data that unfortunately in many cases are uh, mostly uh, uh, focused on uh, individuals of European ancestry. But then we use those data to make inferences about susceptibility to diseases and apply those to individuals from underrepresented backgrounds. So uh, the NIH now has a new program called All of Us, which is trying to address some of these deficiencies in data sciences. So Pride A Gold is uh, funded by NHLBI. Uh, we are one of nine funded Pride sites. Uh, Pride stands for programs to increase diversity about, among individuals engaged in health-related research. The target uh, is junior faculty members from underrepresented backgrounds. In addition to the usual career development activities like grant writing, building inclusive labs, et cetera, we also do bias, bias and standard training, coaching using social science, cognitive theories. And we've had 18 scholars who have participated and we just uh, submitted um, uh, a renewal for this uh, AGOL, but now we are focusing on expanding the focus of Pride AGOL to include data sciences in general, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how biases inherent in coding or the programming of computers and instruments can produce bias results and ultimately lead to or perpetuate.
health disparities. And I have to say that Dr. DeCamp is actually joining our team as one of the multiple PIs. So our focus now is going to be health AI and data science in cardiovascular and pulmonary disease application and bioethics. So we're waiting to hear about funding. We've got a really good score, but you know, the, the, the budget has not been approved yet, unfortunately. So I'm going to skip this, but again, we are looking at uh, omics data and how AI and machine learning can be applied, but doing it in an ethical way. And again, with Dr. DeCamp's help, hopefully we'll be able to uh, be very successful with this. So um, again, the usual mentoring activities, we have the coaches, but what is more critical about this is that integrating bioethics into the curriculum with a focus on AI, ML ethics and bias will position our scholars, the newly appointed scholars, to be leaders in this field. And as we know, this is a topic that is in everybody's minds, everybody's talking about it. And I can tell you that program uh, people at NIH really, really like this topic. So I believe that was my last slide. So thank you so much for your attention and any questions? Questions, maybe I'll start with a quick question. I was wondering your reflections on Professor, um, on, on our keynote presentation, just some of the techniques. I think maybe she was implicitly suggesting they could be used around issues of diversity, but I didn't see her mention those. Do you think some of those techniques have overlap for the what you've described? Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, even though she didn't explicitly mention them, I mean, obviously in order to have an ethical and uh, um, ethical research lab, you have to be inclusive and listen to all of the voices, right? So everybody's going to have perspectives and by giving everybody in the team agency then and, and being very transparent, then people won't be afraid to raise an issue. For example, like one of the case studies that she showed that someone will say, you know, I really think that those data are faulty or incomplete data sets, et cetera, but everybody has been given the, the agency to say something, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know the very hierarchical structure where everybody's afraid of the PI and I don't I don't want to show my weakness. But yes, there are a lot of of commonalities between you know creating an inclusive and ethical research lab and what she was saying. Mm -hmm. So definitely translatable. Great. Question here. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, great talk. So I was curious about the the program where you use. Um, you're investigating biases in AI, and, and I guess I, I found I don't know something clicked. Like you have the the first set of slides was about um, equity, um, equality, equity, and inclusion. So I was wondering if you if your program is thinking about re getting more data because sometimes these algorithms are learning from data, and yes, you can say the data is biased, and we'll fix that in the algorithm side. But uh, is NIH or you interested in maybe getting more data from these underrepresented populations? Um, to, so to, to fix the issue at the source. For no, and I think um, NIH um, has recognized that and that's why they started the All of Us program. And I don't know, maybe Matt, you want mm -hmm. to say something about that? Yeah, no, I, I think solving the data problem is is a key is a key part of the solution. Now, solving it is not easy. I mean, that's where community engagement and authentic relationships really matter. Right, and the, you know, the All of Us program is trying to expand the data set, right? So... They have enlisted, for example, the scholars from our Pride Eagle program are now participating in the All of Us, and all of them are from uh, backgrounds underrepresented in science and medicine. So again, by expanding, publicizing, marketing this new tool that the NIH has, hopefully people will provide specimens that now will expand the data set, and we don't have to rely on on data sciences that re rely almost ex exclusively on individuals from. Uh, I think diversity in the research team is just absolutely key too, because at that algorithmic analytic step, that's where choices of variables matter, choices of the analytic techniques matter. And so having that diverse research team is really important, even if you had a perfectly balanced and fair data set. Um, sure. You know, press and hold. Yep. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Nice talk. I was just wondering, in the area, and I may have missed this, I apologize, I had to step out for just a moment, but in the area of clinical research, you know, when you're consenting potential participants, 
we're kind of learning more and more in the clinical environment that the patients do better if they're cared for by people with similar cultural and ethnic backgrounds and even language, of course, and things. And I know, you know, sometimes it's challenging enough in the clinic to communicate, you know, across language using a portable interpreter, you know, things, but consenting someone for a complex clinical trial using that sort of communication and really it, it's suboptimal. And, uh, you know, we could do better in that area. And yet it's probably not possible to diversify relatively small research teams in a way that you would cover all of the different language possibilities and things. How do you recommend addressing that? Well, I mean, like you said, you can cover all of the language possibilities, but, you know, one way that we're trying to address is by diversifying the workforce, right? The, the, the delivery of the workforce so that those who are delivering healthcare look like those who will be the recipients. Of course, you know, that's a process that takes a lot of time. And I think we are uh, doing a much better job now. I mean, I've been here for 35 years and I'm very impressed with, you know, how we have advanced, but Dave, you know that a lot of these policies are as good as the leaders, right? Because they can talk and talk, we care about diversity, but then do nothing about it and put no resources. So that the only way that we can really start moving the needle is by putting the resources. But it's, 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 a, it's a very, very uh, complicated question. And, you know, you can find interpreters for almost for all of the languages that are spoken here at the hospital by the patients. But, you know, what you can try to do is find someone who can communicate as much as possible with the patients and patient families. It's interesting because it has implications beyond the individual patient who might choose not to participate if they don't feel as though they can fully trust or understand the person they're communicating with. It also then impacts the diversity of the patient population enrolled in the trial, which is a which problem. can have really important right. implications. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I just took the city uh, test. And one of the things they say is that when you're consenting patients, you really need to keep, keep in mind, you know, socioeconomic status, you know, whether they can communicate at whatever level of, of, uh, of literacy, et cetera. So all of those things have to be considered. And again, it's always, taking into account that the patient needs to be informed and how will they be and the general public be um, um, will actually be benefit from participating in the study. But it's important, again, transparency is also very critical when you're consenting patients. Great. Okay. Great. There'll be more time. We have our panel too. So let's thank Dr. Flores. Thank you.